In this unit, we continue our theme of looking at addition reactions that alkenes undergo. And we're going to be focusing specifically on a reaction we refer to as hydrogenation, or adding hydrogen across the carbon-carbon double bond. And as you can see an example here, toward the bottom of the screen, we've taken an alkene, we treat it with hydrogen, H2 gas, and a metal catalyst such as platinum, which we have there. And what's going to happen is that the two hydrogen atoms are going to get added to the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond, here and here, giving us, in our final product, an alkane. So we've taken that carbon-carbon double bond and we've reduced it to a carbon-carbon single bond. So let's go ahead and look at this reaction in a bit more depth. And first off, as we start looking at this reaction, I'm going to remind you of a bit of information about the various oxidation states of organic molecules. So when we think about going from a more reduced molecule to a more oxidized molecule, we can think in terms of the number of bonds between carbon and hydrogen as one of our ways of looking at the oxidation of a molecule. So if we're talking about a molecule that is more reduced, what we're referring to is a molecule that has a higher number of bonds between carbon and hydrogen. As we go to a molecule that's more oxidized, that's going to correspond to a decrease in the number of bonds between carbon and hydrogen. And in the case of looking at hydrocarbons, that is alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, that will correspond to installing more carbon-carbon double bonds or triple bonds to account for the removal of the carbon-hydrogen bond. So if we take a look at the spectrum of hydrocarbons in order from the most reduced hydrocarbon, which would be our alkanes, because those have the highest number of carbon-hydrogen bonds per carbon atom, because each of those carbon atoms of the chain is fully saturated with hydrogens, meaning it's fully maxed out the number of hydrogens that is allowed per carbon. So we describe an alkane as being fully saturated, much like a fully saturated fat is a fat that has just carbon-carbon single bonds throughout the carbon chain. And as we head on along from a more reduced molecule going toward more oxidized molecules, we go from alkane to alkenes. So we'll put in a carbon-carbon double bond in this molecule, and that would cause this molecule to be described as unsaturated because it does not have the maximum number of hydrogens within the molecule. Instead, a couple of those hydrogens from the alkane have been replaced with a carbon-carbon double bond. And then from there, we go to alkynes, which have the carbon-carbon triple bond. And so going from a four-carbon alkene to a four-carbon alkyne, we have to remove additional hydrogen atoms so that we can avoid going over that cat rule. And so therefore, alkynes are also referred to as unsaturated molecules, unlike alkanes, which are saturated, meaning the maximum number of hydrogens are present there. So in order to go from an alkane to an alkene to an alkyne, what we would need to do in each of those cases is carry out what would be described as an oxidation reaction, where we're oxidizing the alkane to give an alkene, and then oxidizing further to give an alkyne. Now in the case of talking about reactions of alkenes, the reaction we're going to focus on here is the reverse reaction of going from an alkene to an alkane. And we would describe that reverse reaction as being a reduction reaction because we're taking alkenes, which are more oxidized, adding hydrogens to them, which is going to make alkanes, which are more reduced. Same thing if we were going from an alkyne to an alkene, we describe that as a reduction of the organic molecule there. So we're going to focus specifically in this unit on reactions that involve taking alkenes and reducing them to alkanes. So let's talk about what reagents we can use to carry out those reactions and talk about features related to the stereoselectivity or regioselectivity of those reactions. So the way that we're going to talk about reducing alkenes in this unit is through a reaction referred to as hydrogenation, or the addition of hydrogen across the carbon-carbon double bond to convert an alkene into an alkane. And if you look at food labeling, you may see terms such as partially hydrogenated oils. What that refers to is the situation where a 
unsaturated fat, which has carbon-carbon double bonds in it, is reacted with hydrogen to result in the conversion of some of those double bonds to single bonds. They call it partially hydrogenated because not all the alkene groups are converted into alkanes, but just some of them are. So therefore it's partially hydrogenated oils. And that's sometimes done to change the flavors or texture of food products. So we're gonna look at how that process takes place in the lab, starting with an alkene starting material such as this one. The molecule could be cis or trans to start with. We've used a trans or Z configuration there. And the molecule will be reacted with hydrogen gas, H2. And then the other component of the reaction that's required to make this go at an appreciable speed is a metal. And the metal acts as a catalyst. And the specific role that the metal generally plays in this reaction is it provides a substrate on which the hydrogen gas and the alkene will be brought together into close proximity so that they are able to interact with each other and hence react with each other. So typical metals that we'll see providing this substrate for the reaction to occur on and acting as a catalyst are gonna be metals such as platinum, palladium, nickel, and a variety of others as well. So pretty much if you're looking at a reaction, you see hydrogen present there and some sort of elemental metal listed with that, you can expect that the type of reaction occurring is a hydrogenation reaction, just meaning that the hydrogen is going to add across the carbon-carbon double bond. So the product of this reaction is gonna to correspond to adding two hydrogens, one to each of those two carbons. There will be no sorts of carbocation rearrangements or anything during this reaction. So literally, you just look at each of the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond here and here and recognize you're gonna add one hydrogen to each of those two carbons and the double bond will go away as a result of that so we don't go over the octet rule and your final product there will be an alkane. So the carbon skeleton is going to stay exactly the same. We're just going to be bringing in a hydrogen onto each of the two carbons of the alkene. We can look at the stereochemistry of this reaction and we'll do that with an example problem that has a cyclic alkene. So we'll use cyclohexene as our starting material here. And we're going to go ahead and plug in some sort of metal. So I'll just use palladium. And for the H2, we'll go ahead and plug that in. Our product of this reaction corresponding to adding an H to each of the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond will give us this product, where of course we have a CH2 here. One of those hydrogens is newly added and a CH2 here. So we've gone from CH, of course, in the starting material to CH2 in the product by adding that H2. Now, if we're trying to look at the stereochemistry of this reaction, we run into a little bit of a problem based on the way that we've set this up so far, in that our final product here, CH2 and CH2, has no chiral center at either of these two carbons. So there's no way to tell at this point which of those hydrogens was newly added of the CH2 groups and which one was there to start with. So there's no way to tell whether the two hydrogen atoms that were brought in anew were added cis to one another or trans to one another. In other words, there's no way to tell whether those two hydrogens were added sen or whether they were added anti to each other. So to help us address that question, what we can do is employ isotopes of hydrogen in order to look at the stereochemistry of this reaction. And this is gonna be a very common way to go about, in general, looking at whether reactions are stereoselective or not is by using labeled molecules, isotope labeled reactants, so that we can see exactly where each atom of each reactant has ended up during the course of the reaction. So isotopes are going to be very useful for looking at the stereochemistry of these reactions. So we're going to use isotopes to evaluate the stereochemistry, and specifically, not really just the stereochemistry, but really the stereoselectivity of the reaction. Is there a preference for how the two hydrogen atoms are added relative to one another? A very common way to go about showing and tracing the stereochemistry outcome is to use rather than standard old hydrogen, the hydrogen of one isotope, instead to use deuterium, which is commonly abbreviated as a D rather than an H. So we could put in D2 plus our metal catalyst, palladium or platinum or whatever we like to use there. And D2 
the D in that refers to using deuterium. And deuterium is just the hydrogen 2 isotope. So it's hydrogen that has an extra neutron relative to the standard most common form of hydrogen that we see in the environment. And the advantage of that is that we can trace using a variety of analytical chemistry experiments where that deuterium atom ends up at in the final product. And so what we would observe for this reaction is if we ran the reaction with deuterium rather than with the most common hydrogen one isotope, what we would find is that the two deuteriums, our isotope labeled hydrogens in other words, would add sen to one another. So what we would see is that our final product would correspond to having both of those deuteriums on the same face of the molecule. So they would add cis to each other. So we'd have two products that we could draw here, one that would correspond to both of the deuteriums as a wedge, the other that would correspond to them both as a dash. So based on this information, when we use this isotope label, we can conclude for this particular reaction that we can show the stereoselectivity of it. And specifically, we would describe this as a stereoselective sen addition that's going on because the two deuterium atoms are adding to the same face of the molecule. They end up cis to one another. And so, so as we conclude here with our discussion of hydrogenation, in addition to talking about the possible stereoselectivity of the reaction, which we can observe if we use isotope labeled precursors here, isotope labeled reagents that is, we could also ask whether the reactions are regioselective. Do they have a preference for making certain constitutional isomers over others? And the answer to that question is no. These reactions cannot be regioselective because of the fact that we're adding two identical atoms, two identical hydrogens across the carbon-carbon double bond. So therefore, the reactions of hydrogenation cannot be regioselective because regioselectivity, to make a specific constitutional isomer preferable over another, would require that we're adding two different atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond. And that's been true throughout our discussion of different types of addition reactions. For a reaction to be regioselective, you have to be adding two different atoms to two carbons and have a preference for which atom goes onto each of the two carbons, the carbon-carbon double bond. Otherwise, the reaction can't be regioselective. So cases where we're adding H2 across the carbon-carbon double bond or Cl2 across the carbon-carbon double bond, anytime we're adding two identical groups, the reaction can't be regioselective. Likewise, if we're starting off and our alkene molecule is equally substituted, in other words, it's symmetrical relative to each of the two carbon-carbon um, each of the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond, then the reaction can't be regioselective either because there's no way for the reaction to prefer to make one stereoisomer, one constitutional isomer over another. So with that, we conclude our discussion of hydrogenation reactions. You are expected to be able to provide the products of these reactions if you're given the reactants, the reactants being an alkene plus hydrogen and a metal catalyst, you should be able to provide the product of the reaction I don't expect you to be able to provide a mechanism for this reaction, though. You don't need to be able to show all the electron pushing arrows to make the pathway from reactant to product. You just need to be able to show the final product, which will always correspond to adding a hydrogen to each of those two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond.